Well, good morning to all of you. And to those of you who are watching online, welcome to you as well this morning. Uh, to those of you who are visiting, who are guests today, either in person or online, my name is Tim and I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Church. And this is the first time I've had a chance to see you in 2022, so Happy New Year. Happy New Year to uh, all of you. Prince Caspian is uh, one of the stories in the Chronicles of Narnia series written by C.S. Lewis. And I'm gripped in that particular book, Prince Caspian, by an interchange that happens between Lucy Pevensey and Aslan, that, uh, that lion character who represents Jesus in the uh, Chronicles of Narnia stories. And in this interchange, Lucy says, Aslan, you're bigger. And Aslan responds, that's because you're older, little one. Not because you're bigger. I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. I love that last line. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. And uh, I think many of you would resonate with this. May 2022 be a year in which we grow. Personally, individually, as well as corporately as a fellowship at Grace Church. During this coming year, may we discover that God is personal and real and indeed bigger than what we've previously imagined. So early in 2022, we planned a week of prayer. Prayer can be an honest expression of relationship with God. Prayer is about desire for Him. And desire to see uh, His fame spread, to see Him touch lives. So we have uh, titled this prayer week, two Sundays with uh, a number of prayer opportunities through the week. We've titled this year's prayer week, Lord, turn it around. Turn it around. And my guess is that some of you here this morning are really resonating with that as well. Some of you feel like you're up against a wall in some ways. You're in some kind of relational challenge that has been really heavy for you. Or perhaps you're a parent and you have prodigal sons and daughters and it weighs heavily on you. Perhaps some of you have come into today and you're facing some type of a health challenge. We live in a culture that appears to be in many ways unraveling under great pressure and stress, in part because of a pandemic, but more than that, because of a moral unraveling in our culture. And there's, there's a part of us that wants to just stand up and exclaim, Lord, turn it around. Lord, turn it around. So in this first message, it's a two-week series, this Sunday and next Sunday, we're going to think about the theme, prayer first. Prayer first. I'm going to ask you to just pray with me right now as we get ready to dive in, not only to the teaching today, but to this week, which we pray will be a catalytic week in 2022 at Grace Church. Father in heaven, do what only you can do. Father, I pray that you would, um, by your spirit, that you would open our eyes, that you would seize our attention, that you would speak right into our hearts today. Father, there are people who came into this room who are hurting right now. There are people who are bewildered right now. And Lord, we pray you'd meet them right at their point of need. For all of us, Lord, for all of us, intensify and accelerate our desire for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Many years ago, a friend of mine took his family to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. At the time, his son Matthew was about 10 years old. 
And an astronaut came to a gathering of people and he spoke to the audience of people about space exploration in general and more specifically about the achievement of landing astronauts on the moon. And the astronaut was particularly urging the young people who were in the audience to consider the possibility of even greater breakthroughs in the future, in their lifetime. So young Matthew, about 10 at the time, turns to his dad and he says with a serious face, Dad, I'm going to be the first man to land on the sun. My friend Tom thought for a moment, wanting to be respectful, and then said, Okay, Matthew, but do it at night, okay? Do it at night. Without question, without question, men and women have been entrusted by God with remarkable capacities. Nevertheless, honesty constrains us to acknowledge that we do have some ability boundaries, right? We have some ability boundaries. God, however, is infinite. He doesn't have ability boundaries. In the Bible, we learn that all things are possible with God. Nothing is too difficult for him. It's a recurring theme throughout the biblical narrative. Over and over again, God demonstrates his authority over all of life. There's no challenge that overwhelms him, no opposition that overcomes him. All things are possible with God. Nothing is too difficult for him. Now, I want to dare this morning to ask a personal question of myself as well as of all of you. No show of hands here. No show of hands. Do you personally believe all things are possible with God? It was an honest question faced over 2,800 years ago by a king in Judah. The king's name was Jehoshaphat. He was the fourth king in Judah, and the biblical historian tells us, as a summary statement over Jehoshaphat's life, Jehoshaphat sought the Lord with all his heart. How's that for an epitaph over one's life? It's not that Jehoshaphat was perfect. In fact, the biblical narrative honestly includes a couple of real curious incidents of compromise that were costly. Nevertheless, Jehoshaphat's heart for God was a distinctive feature of his life. His father was King Asa. When Asa died, Jehoshaphat succeeded him as king. He was 35 years old when he became king over Judah. And we're told that he reigned over Judah for 25 years. Perhaps the zenith moment in Jehoshaphat's life was the excellent leadership he offered in a time of serious crisis in Judah. And by the way, by the way, think about this. Isn't that the test of real leadership? Honestly? Isn't that the test of real leadership? Leaders who lead well excel in the midst of adversity. Though Jehoshaphat came to power over 2,800 years removed from us, the issue he faced in his crisis is similar to the issue that you're confronted with in your brush with adversity. Here's the question. What's your first move? when facing a life challenge? In other words, what's your reflex? What's your first move when facing a life challenge? King Jehoshaphat was confronted with a major threat in 2 Chronicles 20. If you have a Bible or a Bible app on your phone, you could turn there right now to 2 Chronicles 20. I have found this passage to be a very, very instructive passage. And in fact, I uh, will confess to you that on my second Sunday here at Grace, helping out during the summer of 2019, 
I preached from this passage. This passage is a significant passage to me as it would relate to this practice of prayer. Beginning at verse 1 of 2 Chronicles 20. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, and with them some of the Moonites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea, and behold, they are in Hazazan Tamar, that is, in Gedi. This was serious. This was serious. Jehoshaphat's now about 55 years old in this passage. He's been in office for about 20 years. He's been around the block long enough to know that the nations around Judah loathe the people of Judah. And he also knows that coalitions of enemy nations pose an unconventional threat to the people of Judah. And in verse 2, he hears of a coalition of enemies that's already mobilized and they're pressing toward Jerusalem. We're told that it involved Moabites, Ammonites, Moonites. Those peoples were people who were antagonistic to God and consequently to his people. And we're told that they're in En Gedi. What does that mean? En Gedi was about 25 miles as the crow flies from Jerusalem, about 35 miles away by foot. The point is the enemy is already mobilized and they're advancing, meaning this formidable enemy was probably about two days away. And Jehoshaphat sobered to the core. The beginning of verse 3 tells us that Jehoshaphat was afraid. We get that, right? We get that. The gravity of this threat was massive. We might expect that Jehoshaphat would default into a very defensive posture. Start scurrying around trying to gather his security advisors. Enemies two days away. Reflexively, what's he going to do? While we're following the narrative, let's step out just for a moment out of this historical episode and make this personal again because that is the aim of the Holy Spirit who's with us here this morning, speaking through his word to us. I want to ask myself, as I ask you, what's your first move? When faced with a crisis, what's your first move? You see, I expect there are some of us here this morning, presently, like right now, in your life now, facing some type of serious concern. Many of us know what it means to stare at the ceiling in the middle of the night, not knowing what to do. You realize that at some level, the challenge is bigger than you in and of yourself. So what's your first move? Verses 3 to 4 of 2 Chronicles 20, we see Jehoshaphat choosing to pray first. To pray first. This isn't just stained glass talk. This is a valuable life lesson. As we aim to grow and discover more about knowing the Lord relationally. We say here at Grace Church, we want to know Christ and to make him known. This is a life lesson. It's a strategic principle in knowing the Lord better and better relationally. This is what we read next in the story in verses 3 to 4. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid, set his face to seek the Lord. There it is. 
He set his face to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Please note this. Mark this well from this historical narrative. This happened on the stage of history. In his alarm, Jehoshaphat set his face to seek the Lord. To seek the Lord. This is more than a history lesson this morning. This is about real life. This is about today. This is about today in my life, in your life, in our life together. When I'm brutally honest with my own heart, I recognize in me a tendency at times for my first impulse in the face of challenge is to immediately rely on my own resources and my own ability. That's, the, that's kind of the natural impulse in me. It's not that I don't think of prayer at all. It's just that my natural instinct in the face of challenge tends toward prayer as a last resort. You know, well, I'll do what I can do and then I'll pray. You ever heard that? I'll do what I can do and then I'll pray. Jehoshaphat whoosh, flipped that around. He turned it all the way around. His posture was, I'll pray and then I'll do what God prompts and enables me to do. Now think about this. Think about this. Is it possible that whenever we treat prayer as a last resort, could it be that we have an impoverished view of God? An impoverished view of His power to save and his wisdom and his sovereignty and his personal love toward us. For treating prayer as a last resort, I believe God's spirit is here this morning speaking through his word to us, lovingly urging us to adjust our posture. If we suppose that prayer is a last resort activity, the Spirit is saying, adjust your posture. Make it your first move. In his crisis, King Jehoshaphat looked to God first. Rather than gathering his cabinet and consulting with his joint chiefs of staff, he first looks to God and then he does something interesting. He calls the entire nation of Judah to join him in looking to God. Now here's what's interesting about that. The enemy is probably two days away. And he was calling people from all the cities of Judah. For most of those people, it would have taken a full day for them to travel from where they were to Jerusalem. In other words, with two days, this prayer meeting, this corporate prayer meeting that Jehoshaphat was calling for would take place a day later. Specifically, we're told Jehoshaphat calls the entire nation to a fast a discipline to be combined with prayer as they seek the face of the Lord. Fasting is a spiritual discipline commended in many places in Scripture that helps us to better focus on God, to be satisfied in Him, to relationally know Him better. It usually involves abstaining from food, perhaps a meal a day or a meal for an entire day or to fast from food for several days. 
I think it's also practical and reasonable to think of fasting in these terms in our days. What about fasting from social media for a day or several days? I mean, that might sound like crazy making to some of us. Or to fast from television for a day or several days or perhaps for a week. And in fasting, we aim, our aim in it is to submit all our desires to this one priority desire for God himself. You see, fasting, which involves denial, is more about desire than it is about denial. Jehoshaphat was really clear about his first move called the nation to fast and pray. And when people from all over the land convened together in Jerusalem, Jehoshaphat himself stood up to lead this vast throng in prayer. And the crowd is hushed. Like it is in here right now. And Jehoshaphat doesn't speak to the crowd. He speaks to God on behalf of the crowd. Together, together, the whole nation gets before God. And Jehoshaphat's very instructive prayer is recorded for us in verses 5 to 12. If you have a Bible or a Bible app, you could follow along. This passage is also going to be on the screen. Beginning at verse 5 of 2 Chronicles 20, and Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, Drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you for your name is in this house, and we will cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy, behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession which you've given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we're powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I love that last line of verse 12, right? I mean, does some of us, you know, resonate with that? We do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you. That statement captures well how many of us feel during moments of healthy desperation. And it brings us to a principle that we have touched on multiple times over the last a couple of years here at Grace. The gaze glance axiom. This is, I think, a critically important prayer principle. The issue is this, there's a God in heaven, a creator God, who knows us and loves us. And there are great needs that we have that, uh, that have arisen in our lives. We live in a world that's groaning, a creation that's groaning, a world that's convulsing because of the effects of sin. So we have real need, and we have this God who loves us. And the real issue is, where are you going to place your gaze, and where are you going to place your glance? Because 
Very often what our reflex is, is to stare at our need, to be preoccupied with our need, to be so focused on our need that the best we can do is merely glance in God's direction. What the Bible is calling us to do is turn that around. God the Holy Spirit who's with us this morning is calling us to turn that around and put our gaze on this God who is powerful and great. Nothing's too difficult for him. A God who loves us and who demonstrated it on the stage of history when Jesus went to the cross. And Jesus didn't remain in the tomb. He rose from the dead and he's alive. He secured victory for us. So when we gaze on him and remind ourselves of who he is and how his heart is for us and toward us, when we gaze on him, it's not that we ignore our need over here, but now what happens is we start to see our need from God's perspective. Game changer. Total game changer. It's the gaze glance axiom. When facing a crushing challenge, pray first. And then there's a second valuable principle I want us to notice in this passage. After you pray, obey. After you pray, obey. You can almost hear a pin drop in verse 13. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Can you, can you imagine it? Can you, can, you, can you see it with your heart? Only the sound of the breeze. A few whimpers from babies being held by their parents. And into that stillness and silence, the Spirit of God comes upon a prophet named Jehaziel. Speaking for God, Jehaziel says in verse 15, and he said, listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid. And do not be dismayed at this great horde, for this battle is not yours, but God's. That's a significant line, isn't it? The battle is not yours, but God's. Dropping down to verse 17, you will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. God had spoken. And he was promising victory. He was promising deliverance. Friends, he was going to turn it around. God himself was going to turn it around. Now, when God, when God says that the battle is not ours, but his, that doesn't mean that we become passive. Doesn't mean that. Interestingly, God tells the people in verse 17, you will not have to fight this battle. And a little later in that same verse, he says, go out to face them tomorrow. It almost sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? You won't have to fight this battle. Go out and face them tomorrow. What's going on? What's going on? There's an important principle here, and this is how I would state it. After you pray, obey. After you pray, obey. In other words, as those of us who follow Jesus aim to mature and cultivate a life of increasing faith where we grow in him, 
Prayer is indeed our first move, but it is not our only move. As God responds in answer to prayer, he may choose to deploy us in service, in acts of love, in acts of kindness, in courageously sharing our faith with others. He may choose to deploy us as part of his answer to prayer. He'll be the decisive factor as we face into daunting challenges. He will win the victory and see us through. Jesus calls us to face our challenges knowing he's with us. This past uh, Monday, Ann and I had an opportunity to be with uh, family at Disneyland. And... uh, And while we were there, it reminded me of a time over a quarter of a century ago, I'd taken our oldest daughter, Carissa, uh, to Disneyland. And uh, Carissa, very adventurous, um, uh, not really afraid of much of anything. And she wanted, at 10, she wanted to go on every ride. And we came to Space Mountain, and I tried to caution her a little about Space Mountain, how fast it is. Um, how you get jolted around. And Carissa thought that sounded invigorating. Far more so than I did. So we get onto the ride, and on the very first turn, and it's dark inside this ride, Space Mountain, except for some lights that are supposed to represent stars, Carissa turns to me and she says, Dad, I feel like I'm falling out. And I said to her, Carissa, Carissa, lean into me and I will hold you. Lean into me and I will hold you. And for the rest of the ride, she never said a word, but she leaned into me the whole time. I mean, leaned in as hard as she could into me. And it was my privilege to hold her. And when we came around the last turn on Space Mountain and and it started to slow down, Krissa opens her eyes, sits up and said, Oh, that was so great, Dad. That was so great. What really happened was she let me hold her when she was afraid. She leaned as hard into me as she could when she was afraid. And though Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah had been assured of victory, they were not passive. They were active, partnering with the Lord as he provided enabling to advance. They leaned into him. They leaned into his promise to them. In verses 20 to 30, the biblical historian tells us that the people went out in praise to God, and when they did, and when they did, and when they did, they witnessed with their own eyes the unexplainable deliverance that God accomplished on their behalf. The story ends in verse 30, and the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. God is awesome, right? God is awesome and his power to save is astonishing. In our weighty burdens and challenges, we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, turn it around. From this historical perspective, in the word of God, we learn pray first and after you pray, obey. When we ask the question, what's your first move when facing a daunting challenge? Here's what I believe God's spirit wants to say today to those of us with ears to hear. When facing a challenge that is bigger than you, trust the one who is bigger than your challenge. I want to say this again because I want so much by God's spirit. For this to get pressed deeper into me and deeper into you and into us. When facing a challenge that's bigger than you, engage the one 
who's bigger than your challenge. Be sure of this. Whatever the adversity you may be facing today, God has authority and grace to turn it around. Our Lord comes to people like us who live in a world that's groaning and convulsing because of sin. He comes to people like us who are worn out. Can we be honest? We're worn out from the battle. And he lovingly offers us his inexhaustible strength. And he reminds us he's still the Lord, that he's still reigning. All things are possible for him. Nothing is too difficult for him. So Grace Church, hear my heart. So keep on praying. So keep on praying. Don't give up. Keep on praying. Look to God in whatever the, the challenge, whatever the crisis is that you're facing. God knows you, cares about you. Whatever it is you're facing, keep on praying. Don't give up. Last Sunday morning, I went to a, a church in Sierra Madre, California. A church called Christ Church. It was within walking distance of where Ann and I were staying, about six blocks away. And uh, it was a meaningful morning for me. As part of that worship gathering, I heard a powerful story about a woman named Angela. It's her picture on the screen. Angela Codrington Lipke has been a columnist for many years in the New York Times. Her focus in her columns over many, many, many years has been on fashion and visual culture. And for many years, she was an avowed atheist. She thought religion was tacky and she thought Christianity was the tackiest of all. One day she was in a therapist's office and for her, for her, therapy was really at that point in her life was her religion. And in one of the sessions she blurted out, but who's going to save me? And the therapist said, did you hear what you just said? Angela said, what? She said, you just asked, but who's going to save me? And they both thought that was strange. And then one night, sometime later, not long after, but sometime later, as she was going to bed with her husband, who at the time was also an atheist, she whispered as she was dozing off to sleep, who's going to save me? And her husband aroused her as she's dozing off to sleep and said, do you realize what you just said? What did I say? You said, who's going to save me? And they both were perplexed, wondering, where is this coming from? And then one day on a whim, Andrea, this skeptic atheist, lobs a prayer toward God, derisively, kind of with a laugh. And God moved in response to her prayer. And for the first time in her life, for the first time in her life, she realized there's a God. The following Sunday, her husband was out of town on business and she's curious about God now. So she decides to go to a church in New York City that she's heard about in New York City, a gospel-oriented church, Redeemer Presbyterian Church in mid-Manhattan. And that day, she hears about the love of Christ, 
a love that was powerfully expressed at the cross where Jesus died for her sin. In that day, in that day, Andrea realized this is the God who's been pursuing me. He's been pursuing me. And that day she committed her life in faith to Jesus, who she now believes is the one who has power to save. The next Monday, she goes to, the next day, which was Monday, she goes to work at the New York Times. And at the time, she regularly had lunch with a work associate. They'd been doing this for a number of years on Mondays. They'd go out for lunch together and just kind of get caught up with one another. And Andrea asks her friend, you know, what did you do this weekend? And her friend, you know, responds about some of her activity for that weekend. And then the friend turns the question around and asks Andrea, what did you do? Andrea said, I became a Christian. And Andrea's friend's response was to burst into tears and begin sobbing. And Andrea's wondering, did I, did I say something wrong? And her friend said, for the last eight years we've been meeting for these lunches. And early on at one of those lunches, as I shared something with you about Jesus, you scorned it and ridiculed it and ridiculed me. And I realized that day that my best move for you is to pray for you for the last eight years. For the last eight years, I have prayed for you regularly, consistently, every week and most days of every week. I have prayed for you over these eight years. When I heard that story last week, it pierced my soul because that's not an isolated story. That's the kind of story that's been reproduced over and over on many occasions. And it has been the experience of people who won't give up in prayer. They will press on and press on and press on in prayer. Surrendering outcomes to God who has all authority. Nothing is too difficult for him. He's a God of grace. But press on. And what I want to say to my own soul and to you and to us at Grace Church, keep on praying. Keep on praying. Don't give up. Whatever the challenges that you're facing, God has unique authority to turn it around. In his time, in his way, and he's going to be working in you through the whole of the process as you cry out to him. Father in heaven, God, I pray right now that your spirit would do what only your spirit could do in our hearts and lives. And Father, I pray we would take seriously this historical narrative that you saw fit to include in your word and that your Holy Spirit, who inspired the word, would do in our hearts what only he could do. Father, um, Father, we've called this prayer week and that we want it to be a, a catalytic week, but God... We don't want to isolate prayer to this week or to this day. Lord, we pray that it be a regular part of our lives, of our life rhythms here at Grace. Father, uh, Father, speak in your own way to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.